taken from the Ultimate Killer Collection, by Stuart Dandel. Robert Knapper The Green Chain Rapist Robert Clive Knapper was born in Erith, Greater London, on 25 February, 1966. He was the eldest child of Brian Knapper, a driving instructor, and his wife Pauline. The young Knapper was raised in Plumstead, South East London, in his early years. At school he was a solitary, secretive boy, according to staff and students at South East London's Abbey Wood Comprehensive. Classmates said that the greasy-skinned youth was living in a world of his own, a phrase that would appear to characterize many aspects of his life. It was also said at this time, that Napper aspired to be an astronomer. Robert Napper's home life was desperately unhappy. His mother and father clashed frequently and violently in front of him, and this also affected his two younger brothers and their sister. Eventually, when Napper was nine, his father walked out on his wife and his family. His mother, who had won full custody of the children, became increasingly concerned about her son's behavior as he approached his teenage years. There were numerous things that were different about Robert. Firstly, he would hide behind doors to eavesdrop on family conversations, then he would appear and accuse his relatives of making up stories about him. Also, he was often aggressive, fighting violently with his brothers and he also would lie compulsively. Disturbingly, he also liked to spy on his sister in the shower and when she was undressing. In one situation, while his sister lay sleeping, she awoke to find he had pulled the covers back and was staring at her from the side of the bed. He was clearly suffering from mental illness at a young age. Suspecting this herself, his mother sent him for a psychiatric assessment at the age of 11. The therapy continued for a total of six years and it was discovered at this time, that he had Asperger's syndrome. Mrs. Napper remarried in 1987, though family life wouldn't get any easier. Robert Napper despised his stepfather and refused to talk to him. His relationship with his mother now became increasingly strained also. Gradually Napper descended into reclusiveness and progressively darker moods. These moods would ultimately lead to crime. Medical experts have since stated that at this time, his behavioral disorder was being compounded by a serious mental illness, paranoid schizophrenia. This was a toxic combination that twisted his sense of perspective and reality. Robert Napper would suffer from bizarre delusions, most significantly, he convinced himself he was extremely powerful, achieving godlike status. He also thought he was intensely skillful in perpetrating his crimes and that he was untouchable. Sigmund Freud would have been amazed by his ego. The delusions affected him in other ways too, he believed he was a well-educated millionaire, with a master's degree in maths. He also had himself convinced that he had won the Nobel Peace Prize and that he could communicate by telepathy. This last symptom is reasonably common in most Western forms of schizophrenia. Ultimately, there was a sickening trigger to the transition to depravity. In a brutal encounter, which his crimes would later echo, he was raped in broad daylight while walking in the woods near his home. Robert Knapper was only 12 at the time, and was accompanied by two younger boys who were also assaulted. The year of the attack was 1978. One of his teachers would later state that the attack made him dramatically withdraw, turning him overnight from an unremarkable schoolboy, into a machine. The poor boy had been devastated. Some time later, the class were played a recording of a short story and Robert Knapper was entranced by it, showing emotion for the first time since his tragic encounter. Supposedly he turned pale and started to shake, sweating profusely. At one point the teacher became concerned and thought he was having a seizure. The story that was playing, was The Telltale Heart, by Edgar Allan Poe. In the tale it describes how a madman commits a murder and dismembers the body. It appears that he may have felt some inspiration. In 1986, Robert Knapper committed his first offense, 
he was convicted of a criminal act with an air gun and given a conditional discharge. In August of 1989, Napper would carry out his first serious attack, although this would not be attributed to him until later. A 31-year-old mother who sunbathed in a bikini in her garden, close to Plumstead Common, was raped. After the attack, Napper said to his victim, Want a bit of advice? Don't leave your back door open. In October of 1989, Robert Napper's mother called the authorities to tell them that her son had admitted to perpetrating a rape on Plumstead Common. In a flabbergasting move, the police rejected the information because no case supposedly matched the evidence, this would later be refuted. Even more astonishingly, they didn't speak to Napper or make any further investigation. It can only be thought that they hypothetically considered Napper's mother a troublemaker or unreliable. Either way, their duty to the public certainly wasn't carried out. Had they carried out, said duty, and taken a blood sample, it would have provided a perfect match to the DNA he left on the woman he had raped at that time. There would be further mistakes from the police in this case. Unfortunately, they also came with further consequences for the public. Over the next two years there would be a series of rapes and sexual assaults that adhered to a significant pattern. The perpetrator of these crimes became known as the Green Chain Rapist. He was named so, due to the offenses being in the vicinity of the Green Chain Walk, a string of pathways that link large swathes of southeast London. At this point, concerned about his mental state and the risks he posed, Pauline Napper broke off all contact with her son. On 15 July, 1992, on Wimbledon Common, Robert Napper stabbed a young mother named Rachel Nickel, she was out taking her son for a walk. The scene Napper left behind was one of the most grotesque killings ever to reach the public domain. Napper had basically eviscerated her, his rage was certainly evident. He had stabbed her 49 times and slit her throat. Forensic investigators stated that it would have taken more than three minutes to deliver all the blows. An incredibly long time for rage and adrenaline to linger, the killer had obviously enjoyed it. Any of the wounds to her heart, lungs and liver could have killed her, though the attacker never stopped. Numerous injuries were inflicted on Im's nickel after she was dead. Others, on her hands shows that she had put up a struggle. Although no witnesses came forward to say they heard her scream. Robert Napper then sexually assaulted her and left her body half-naked, her jeans and pants were pulled down to her ankles. When someone stumbled across Alex, Rachel Nichols' son, he was clinging so tightly to his mother's blood-soaked body, they had to prise his hand away from her arm. All the while he was crying and pleading for her to get up. The poor boy had even stuck some paper to his mother's head, as if it was a plaster. Trying to treat her extensive wounds and bring her back to life. The effect on his psyche must have been devastating. After the attack, Robert Napper walked calmly away without a care in the world, disappearing into a black hole of anonymity. Napper was later questioned by police officers over the unsolved attacks on women during that year. Eventually though, he was ruled out of the equation. Robert Napper's victims were almost all of the same type. Young, pretty, usually blonde, all of them would have caught his attention instantly. During every attack, Napper was needlessly and increasingly violent. It didn't matter if the women had children with them. He had no concern or qualms about what they would have to endure. To Robert Napper, they were all game. Napper also kept a variety of A to Z maps in which he plotted positions from where he could peer into women's homes. There were also more sinister reasons for the plots. One particular mark pinpointed an address in Plumstead, quite near to his own home. This was the basement flat where 27-year-old Samantha Bissett lived with her daughter, Jasmine. In November of 1993, in the Bissett home in Plumstead, southeast London, Robert Napper attacked 27-year-old Samantha Bissett and her four-year-old daughter, 
Jasmine Jemima Bissett. Just like Napper's other targets, he had been spying on them before he attacked. Samantha liked to sunbathe in her back garden, occasionally topless. She also never drew her curtains, even when she and her boyfriend made love in the living room. Samantha also left the balcony door open on hot summer nights so Jasmine could get some fresh air. In Robert Napper's eyes, they were easy and fair prey. After gaining entry, Napper stabbed Samantha 20 times in the head and neck. One strike severed her spinal cord, while others cut an artery in her neck and drenched the hall carpet in blood. After she was dead, she was sexually assaulted. Napper then turned his attention to the child, Jasmine, she was just four years and three months old. Robert Napper seriously sexually assaulted her before smothering her with a duvet. He left her dead on the bed, surrounded by her toys. Not content with his actions so far, Napper dragged Samantha's body to the living room and arranged it in the same position in which she and her boyfriend used to have sex. In total, there were 60 stab wounds on Samantha Bissett's mutilated body. He had tried to cut off her leg, and had also sliced open her torso and pulled back her ribcage to expose the internal organs, which he then proceeded to pierce, one by one. It is believed that he savored what he was doing, that he got a thrill from it. Napper took his time and kept his cool, there was no displacement in his mind. Then, in his final act, he sliced off part of her abdomen, taking it as a macabre trophy. The crime scene was so disturbing that a police photographer who recorded it, never returned to work again. Samantha's stepfather, John Morrison, would later state that the family, will never get over what he did to us. By this time, the fatally floored green chain rape inquiry had already plotted to a conclusion, police had run out of ideas. The Plumstead Dripper case on the other hand, swung into action and was intense in its momentum. It was a fingerprint from inside Samantha's flat which would eventually lead to an arrest. In May of 1994, Robert Clive Knapper, a 28-year-old warehouseman, was arrested on suspicion of murder. In October, 1995, Robert Clive Knapper was convicted at the Old Bailey of the murder of Samantha and Jasmine Bissett. He also chose to admit a rape offense and two more attempted rapes at this time. In December of 1995, Knapper was questioned in light of Rachel Nichols' death, but he denied any involvement. The subsequent investigation to find Rachel Nichols' murderer, resulted in the attempted prosecution and entrapment of a completely innocent man, Colin Stagg. Later advances in DNA profiling revealed Robert Knapper's connection to the crime scene. On the 18th of December, 2008, Robert Clive Knapper was convicted of the manslaughter of Rachel Nickel, on the grounds of diminished responsibility. He also admitted to three other attacks on women. He was remanded into the care of Broadmoor High Security Hospital indefinitely.